this is uh, this is just a, just very important to always have in mind when we're talking about management. Um, so management combines both parts of making the diagnosis, and that's that's taking a history, doing the clinical examination, and then investigations, and then treatment. So it's the whole package that makes up what we consider to be management. Um, ocular complications of diabetes, so we're, we're going to focus on diabetic retinopathy and specifically maculopathy, but don't forget the other complications of, of diabetic eye disease. Um, retinovascular complications are, are common, such as retinal vein occlusion, um, cataract and glaucoma. The pathophysiology of, of retinopathy. So this is this is just a very uh, uh, base. Uh, the, the 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 key points I want you to take take from this is that it's all about high blood sugar. So diabetic retinopathy is all about the hyperglycemia and activating cytokine pathways um, within the cells. Um, to couple of things I've picked out in red here are the cytokine network involving VEGF, which is very important in our treatments. And that's where the increased vascular permeability comes in. Um, and this pathway we'll come to a little later as well called the RAS pathway, the renin-angiotensin pathway. These are just very increasingly important now because treatments are being geared towards specific pathways. So it is very complicated. This is a small part of what actually is going on in the cells. But if you just remember that it is all about high blood sugar and um, activating these different pathways, a big part of which is, is VEGF. Um, so once you get the increased permeability, the other sides of that are vascular occlusion, so occlusion and permeability, and leading to near vascularization. So again, just to stress, diabetic retinopathy, it's a microvascular complication, and the two parts of that are capillary leakage, which is what we're interested in in diabetic macular edema, and capillary occlusion. Classification into non-proliferative, proliferative, and maculopathy is quite an, it's an important part. It, thinking of maculopathy as a separate part of the classification is very important. So we classify the retina into non-proliferative and proliferative, and then a separate classification for the maculopathy. Um, the visual loss secondary to maculopathy very largely. So diabetic maculopathy is the, is the leading cause of, of visual loss in diabetes. It is usually the edema and not the ischemia. Um, and that is, is a leading cause in, in many developed countries still of um, visual loss in working age population, not currently in the UK. Um, and part of the reason thought to be behind that has been the, the success of the screening programs, but it is a very important cause of, of visual loss. The more dramatic cause of visual loss that we see from time to time, which is secondary to proliferative retinopathy, and that's vitreous hemorrhage or tractional retinal detachment, is actually rarer. Um, obviously, we, we see it a lot as ophthalmologists, but it's, it's DMO that's the problem. And it, with the um, uh, epidemic of diabetes that is currently where we're well into a, a major epidemic, there are going to be tens of millions of patients across the world with, with visual loss secondary to diabetic macular edema. This is a major um, world health problem, so not to be underestimated. So just to a few, just to give you a few pictures. So this is the exudative side of macular edema. So a very typical picture showing um, on the left-hand side showing um, ex exudative maculopathy with with exudates in the in the retinal layers, and then on the on the right um, showing a fluorescein angiogram with leakage in the in the parafoveal area. Ischemic maculopathy. It's, we describe it um, clinically as a featureless macula often. That doesn't mean that we're not seeing hemorrhages, but when you look with stereo, the retina is very flat. You can see that there is thinning of the retina. These deep blot hemorrhages are very significant. So not just small um, microaneurysms and small hemorrhages, but these, these larger, deeper ones imply that they're deeper within the retinal layers. 
and um, this would be a very typical clinical picture of, of ischemia. And what we're seeing in the fluorescein angiogram is, a, is an enlarged phase. So there's dropout of retinal capillaries here, um, and this is enlarging and becoming ischemic. Can we take a question? Yes, absolutely. Um, there that. is a question from uh, Kushal. I'm going to ask you to talk, Kushal. Can you hear us? Hi, Kushal. I think I think you are. Um... You're muted. I've I'm, I've allowed you. Yeah. I've allowed you ask to. Um, I've allowed you to talk, but okay. I've asked him to unmute, but he hasn't. Okay, so we carry on, I guess. Yeah. Do you want me to to answer? Um, no, he hasn't written. He hasn't written the question. He what he um, um I've permitted him to talk, but he hasn't unmuted himself. So. Okay, okay, we carry on. You can, we'll come back anyway at any yeah. any point if you want me to to answer anything. I'm happy to take questions at any stage. Um, so best treatment for diabetic retinopathy, the best treatment is preventing it in the first place. That is really key. When you see these patients um, in practice, you are seeing them at a stage where you can really influence what is going on by um, uh, making them aware of the underlying cause for their eye disease. So the key risk factors, and I'll go through this fairly quickly because there are a lot of, of studies, but they are the, these are the, the absolute pivotal studies. The key risk factors are duration of disease, the diabetic control, and the hypertensive control, but also of great importance in, in how the disease is, is the patient has, has um, kidney disease, nephropathy, and also their cholesterol control. Sam, do you want to put up the first um, uh, question on the poll? Absolutely. Just have a have a go at that. Can you see the poll? Can you see the poll? I haven't got it. Have the. Okay. I want. Okay. I'm happy if need. Yeah, I've got it now. Yep. So if people want to put their answer into that. Okay, we're going to have to stop sharing. Um, there's something stuck with the poll, but if okay, we can, no problem. we can do it. We can do it at the end, Sam. I mean, we can do all the questions at the end. Um, it's absolutely fine. I'll close that. Maybe in the chat, some yeah. people you yeah. can no answer. At all. Anybody, yeah. Maybe. Would anybody like to answer the question in the chat, and then I will reel it off. Okay, here we go. B, B, B. It seems like most people are going for yep. uh, macular edema. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, that's absolutely correct. And all those other factors with with visual loss, as I say, are um, it can be much more much more dramatic, particularly with proliferative retinopathy. But it's the, it's the DMO that's the that's the leading cause. So yes, yeah, so there are we've been through the key risk factors. So just just a very brief overview from the trial. So diabetic control. So this is this is a, a, a just quite a neat way of thinking about it. For a one percent reduction in the HbA1c, which is the blood test that shows us um, an averaging of blood sugars, um, that equates from from tr really good quality trial data to a thirty percent reduction in retinopathy. And there is a legacy effect, which means even if somebody has had years of very poor control, they're, they're, if, if that then goes into very good control, that, is, that, is, um, that continues. So there, there is a legacy effect within the, within the blood vessels. Blood pressure control, extremely important. Um, so that's another question to ask, ask your patients. 
And again, a sort of take home is for a 10, 10 millimeter mercury reduction in systolic blood pressure equates to about a 10% reduction in vitreous hemorrhage or uh, necessity to laser. And the blood pressure currently, there are a lot of different blood pressure regimes, but the blood pressure currently taken is 140 over 90. That's relatively high for a diabetic patient who has, has advanced retinopathy. Um, but they, these are there are other factors that go into treatment modalities, for example, um, for blood pressure. But it's a very uh, critically important when we are seeing patients for um, management of their macular edema, if their blood pressure is very poorly controlled, um, then we ask the physicians to try and do something about it. And there are certainly situations where you can avoid treatment and you can even resolve the macular edema by bringing the blood pressure under, under good control. Um, and then hyperlipidemia control, again, there's very good trial data, but it's less of less um, significance than blood pressure and the hyperglycemia, but it is still, still of importance. So if we go to um, investigations, the, um, this is now all about what we call multimodal imaging. Um, we use a variety of different imaging techniques when we see the patients. Um, OCT is our absolute, uh, uh, it, it's, it's the, the investigation that we now cannot do without. Um, fluorescein angiogram is used less, um, but still has a very valuable place, and we'll come to that in a little while. And then there is OCT angiography, um, which some of you may be familiar with, which we are just learning a lot about over the last few years. It's still in its infancy in terms of us using it to guide treatments. We, we don't yet have enough data to know how to, how to utilize it to guide treatments, but with um, artificial intelligence um, platforms, et cetera, this, this is, is, a, is a huge area and there'll be a lot of, a lot of data coming and a lot of um, papers that you see will, will talk about OCT angiography. There's two um, different capillary plexi in the retina, you'll see there, there's SCP, the superficial capillary plexus and the deep capillary plexus. It's the deep capillary plexus that's of real interest in diabetes and where the capillaries start to drop off in ischemic changes. So we're using it, OCT angiography, what it doesn't show is leakage. It shows us where there is dropout of blood vessels. So what it's picking up is flow throughout the blood vessels and where there isn't flow, you'll just see a void space. So an increased, uh, increased black area and increased, um, as you can see in the, in the images there. Fluorescein angiography, on the other hand, can show us um, areas of ischemia, but also leakage. But it's the OCT that really is our, our um, it's, it's the, the investigation that we use not only to diagnose diabetic macular edema, but also to guide us in treatment and monitoring. So the whole, it's, it's very much multimodal. Shall we have another poll question, um, Sam, number two, the systemic factors question? Yeah, let's, okay. Oh, wow. Okay. Again, I can't see the responses, I'm afraid, but if you let me know. Okay, so people are still responding. So far, we've got 23%. Oh, it's going up. A, 28%. D, all of the above, 74%. C, 2%. And blood pressure control, 15%. Uh, Sure, that's great. So yes, uh, you, the D's the D's have it. So it's all of those are important. Um, the blood sugar, as I say, the hyperglycemia is the key. Um, but all of those factors are important and can influence what's what's it can influence um, macular edema. Yeah. So well done. So back to our imaging. So multimodal imaging, OCT being the absolute key, but we also use OCT angiography and fluorescein angiography on occasion. And what you need to get familiar with are the um, is the anatomy of the OCT. So you need to know your layers in the OCT if you are using OCT. 
Um, there is going, there is a huge amount of data now. And again, with AI, we're going to be seeing a great deal more. So the AI is being used to um, look at very specific things and tell us really whether or not these things are, are important and are important for particular um, uh, diseases. So OCT, this is all about OCT, what we call biomarkers. So what is it in the OCT? This is what we're starting to look at clinically. Um, and this is and and as a and also being fed through the AI program. So we're starting to learn a lot more about what is very significant. So subretinal fluid, um, rather than just intraretinal, the intraretinal cysts and intraretinal fluid. Subretinal fluid is a poor prognostic sign. Hyperreflective dots. So these are, and I'll show you some some pictures of this in a moment. So they're known as hyperreflective dots. Um, the, these are thought to be um, uh, Muller cell, representing Muller cell activities. Muller cells are very important in, in the retina, in the metabolic activity, and hyperreflective dots are thought to be actually representing what's, got, what's going on inside those particular cells. So they're another bad prognostic sign. Disruption of the retinal inner layers, this... this um, uh, known as drill um, again this is a very important I'll show you I'll show you an example of that and these are the three things that we specifically look for as what are called biomarkers so this is influencing the biology if you like from the OCT image these are things that we think are showing us what is actually going on functionally um, within the cells of the retina and the importance of that is it can guide us as to what treatment we may pick for the patient. So these are all thought to give indication of more inflammation. Diabetes is an inflammatory disease. There is inflammation. Anti -VEGF, VEGF is part of inflammation, but um, these are thought to give very specific indicators of high inflammation in the retina. And in those situations, we would consider giving steroid for the macular edema rather rather than anti-VEGF. So anti-VEGF has anti-inflammatory properties, that is true, but it's mainly the anti-permeability um, side of, of the treatment, whereas all the other inflammatory markers that are, are thought to be released, um, we believe that these three Currently, these three biomarkers are telling us a, a lot about that, and, and it, it, that's, that's being shown in clinical practice. So they are, we can relate them to what's happening. We can give the patient a lot of VEGF injections and see very suboptimal responses, give them a steroid injection, and the macular edema can resolve much quicker. So know your OCT, learn the layers, and start to look out for these um, biomarkers. So just to give a few examples, so here we see cysts of intraretinal fluid, the little white dots here. So these are not exudates. These are tiny pinpoint dots, which are known as the hyper, hyper reflective dots, which are in the central part of the retina and are thought to represent, as I say, Muller cell activity um, and subretinal fluid. So this is a prime example of an OCT that we would see and consider that the patient may benefit more from steroid um, if we were treating this um, than an anti-VEGF injection. And the example below is just showing exactly that. It's showing a, a patient treated in this case with, um, with steroid medication after one, um, one injection, the retina becoming almost flat and the edema resolving. So we have Ash with his um, hand up. Uh, sure. Maybe we can take a question from him. Of course. Go ahead, Ashley. I think you're muted. You're muted as well. You need to unmute. I forgive me. It was a mistake. No worry. No worry at all. So um, this is just a, a, a showing you a little bit more of, of this. This what we we term drill. So not being able, so it's where we can't distinguish the, the boundaries of the retinal layers. So you have to know your layers of the, of the, the OCT. Um, and this is showing examples where you can't, you've got this, 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 um, uh, this drill um, where we're not able to distinguish individual layers. 
and um, that is um, associated with a worse prognosis for the patient. So um, it's, it's indicative of changes within the cells, if you like, so functional changes. So we have plenty of situations where we can get the, the OCT pretty perfect in terms of getting rid of fluid and the vision just doesn't play catch up. So we don't, we can't correlate for the patient, the visual improvement and the reduction in the, the resolution of the edema. Um, and that's always very disappointing. So if we're able to actually let the patient know prognostically what's likely to happen. So yes, we can, we, we want to stabilize the vision and we can do that with our current treatments, but you are unlikely to get full resolution of vision. And that is very, very important. And, and the reason it's so important is because these are seriously onerous treatments. Patients are having to come in and we'll see that a little later, They're having to come in for very frequent treatments. So you need to have the patient engaged in what's going on with their disease because this is, this is hardcore coming in for these and having injections each time. So you need to be able to say, yes, we can get things better or we are aiming to stabilize for you and again, we're going to be getting a lot more information out of ai um what's, uh, in the in the next couple of years shall we go for the next couple of um questions sam so number three and number four on the poll yeah here we go Are you able to see yep, it? That's there? great. I can see that now. Yeah, perfect. So that's that's right. It's not a rapid reduction. The point of the question is that this is not a rapid reduction of central vision. This diabetic macular edema takes takes time. Yep. Very Let's good. The and the next question. Just sharing the results with everybody. And now we will go to question four. And there may be more than one involved here as a correct answer. So I don't know if it'll pick that up. I don't know whether you can you can actually put in more than one for the... We have a question. Is the steroid injection a one-off treatment that lasts? Yeah, so we'll we'll come to that. Actually, we're coming to treatments next. So um, if if that's okay, I'll just hold off answering that, and I'll, I'll come back to it when we go through the treatments. Thanks. Okay. Sure. So in terms that's of the cool. poll, sorry if if it was. Um, I, I don't know whether you're able to to put in more than more than one, but we so photography is used OCT obviously fluorescein angiogram OCT angiography the one thing that isn't used is you're quite right is is visual fields that is that is not a um a test that would provide us with any additional information for macular edema so well done there okay so we can get rid of that so moving on, so we've talked about OCT and the biomarkers. Fluorescein angiography, we use less now, um, partly because we're using, uh, we're, we're interested in OCTA, which is non-invasive. Fluorescein requires giving an intravenous injection. Um, it's, all, it's very safe. It's been used for many, many decades, but there is a, a very small risk of anaphylaxis. It's not a particularly, um, nice thing to have to have to have an intravenous injection put your chin on a machine and have lots of pictures taken and light shone in your eyes but it's not a particularly pleasant pleasant test but it gives us very um important information so we do still use it in particular situations but less so now um because bec largely because of oct um we know there's edema so we don't need to see that there's there's leakage but we may need to see if we're using laser treatment which i'll come to we may be interested in very specifically where the leakage is coming from if we can't see that clinically it's also useful for ischemia and very valuable for assessing peripheral ischemia. So if we're not sure whether or not there's proliferative retinopathy, and particularly actually this is in, in young patients, so young diabetics in their 30s, that sort of age group who've had diabetes for some years, 
and present with macular edema, you have to be very careful about assessing the periphery. There may be very little to see. You may see very little in terms of um, hemorrhages, cotton wool spots, et cetera, in terms of retinopathy, but they may have significant dropout in the periphery. And although that may not need treating, um, the importance of that is, is how closely you monitor them. So yes, yeah, so it's, it's valuable for leakage and ischemia. And the one thing OCTA can't do, as we said before, is show us leakage. So the OCT angiography, as I said, I mean, we're getting absolutely beautiful, beautiful pictures. There are things that, you know, these, these are things that we only ever had um, previously from, from casts of um, blood vessel casts from cadavers, for example, and from animal experiment models. Um, this is showing us in, in, in the living eye, which is absolutely incredible. So what it's picking up is the flow of um, cells within the blood vessels. You're not seeing blood vessels here, you're seeing flow. So where there isn't flow is where the capillaries have dropped out. So if we go to treatments, so the um, uh, standard of care for treatments now for diabetic macular edema are intravitreal injections and anti-VEGF. That's the absolute standard of care throughout the, throughout the UK and throughout most of the world um, have access to anti-VEGF now, um, not necessarily for DMO, but it is, um, that's, that is the mainstay of treatment. Steroids are being used um, increasingly, and we talked a little bit about the biomarkers that we, we look for in the OCT that may guide us as to which treatment to start. Um, but on the whole, in the UK, patients will usually be started on loading doses, which means monthly anti-VEGF, and we look for a treatment response within five or six injections, and then may consider switching them at that point. Um, we have laser treatment um, still available, which um, is being used less, although there's a lot of debate in the meetings about, so there'll be a, a lot, there'll be meeting um, um, uh, for, for and against la macular laser um, in almost every retinal meeting now, and there'll be proponents of in both camps. Um, I do use laser. I use it for the macula at a sub-threshold level, which means you're, there is, um, it's very safe for the macula. There is no collateral thermal damage to the retinal cells, unlike conventional laser. Um, you don't see, you don't see damage, and you can't pick dam You can't pick up changes. Um, even on an OCT. So this is at a sub-threshold level, but it's if you've got um, focal areas of leakage um, that are, are threatening the fovea but are not yet sub-foveal and you don't want to start giving intravitreal injections, it certainly still has a place in, in my mind. And, and yeah, there are a lot of people who do still use it, but it's not used very commonly. And it is something that we also can use an, a, as an adjuvant. So these treatments are not exclusive. You can be giving anti-VEGF and then you may do a little bit of laser and a bit more anti-VEGF followed by a steroid. So you can, it, it, it's a, it's, it's, um, you're, you're creating a, um, a very particular, customized treatment plan for each patient depending on what's going on in the macula and the periphery and also what's going on for the patient as a whole which I'll come to. Then there is surgery so vitrectomy is done in relatively few patients who have um, uh, traction so what's called a taut posterior hyaloid and it can be very successful in relieving mac macular edema in those situations it's it's not common there's been some interest recently in try in um, looking to to trial this again to see whether surgery at a even without the taut posterior hyaloid may be um, a cure for macular edema it may actually resolve it but we haven't got answers from that as yet so it's really about intravitreals and particularly anti-VEGF. Um, so when to treat, so um, central center involving macular edema with good vision, so that's more than 79, what are the ETDRS, so the original trials, um, the ETDRS letters, um, which equates to six over 7.5, those patients you can observe. Anything that good, you, you can observe. Um, even if they've got center involving DMO. 
um, and that's come from um, what's known as protocol V in the DRCR net um, uh, trials. I would really encourage you if you're interested to look at the DRCR net. There's a fantastic, fantastic amount of data, many, many thousands of patients who are looked at for all sorts of things, all sorts of treatments are trialed. So there's a, a wealth of information in that in that series. So have a look at those. But protocol V is the one that looked at patients with good vision and whether you needed to treat them or whether you could safely observe them. And what's come out of that is that it's safe to observe. So again, don't worry too much about the multiple boxes here, but this is to show you what we use clinically. So this is in the clinic. We have a patient with reduced vision and what we go through as clinicians in order to make a decision about how to treat them. So the thing I really wanted, wanted you to take on board is the control of systemic factors is, is absolutely paramount, paramount. So we're looking to see how well controlled they are. For example, I mentioned that if, if they've got very uncontrolled blood pressure, you may not jump to do something. You may actually be asking the physicians to control their blood pressure in the first instance. But there are other factors. So apart from that, before you even get to what you're going to be doing in the eye. So there are factors in the eye. Put that to one side. You also have to take account of what's happening systemically. Has the patient had any recent um, cardiovascular incidents or stroke, which is very important when we're considering um, multiple anti-VEGF agents, which are very potent um, agents on blood vessels. Comply their compliance, is there, are they going to be able to come as frequently as you need them to come for the injections? And then the capacity, so huge, huge burden, not just for the patient, but this is a, this is um, clinic burden. And is your, are you able to offer treatments at the intervals that they need to be in order to, to, to um, control the problem? Um, factors in the eye, we would consider glaucoma. Um, and that's because uh, we would not, if there's uncontrolled glaucoma or advanced glaucoma, we'd be very cautious or so there's a, 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 a about giving steroid, which can also put pressure up in the eye. We talk about the lens status. So the lens status is important because NICE guidance currently in the UK does not allow us to treat a phakic patient um, with um, steroid, with a steroid injection. So if they're phakic, we have to use anti-VEGF. We can do cataract surgery and put the steroid in at the same time, but current, this is the current situation. It's different in Europe, but this is a, a finance issue, um, which we've tried to, to fight against for some time unsuccessfully, but um, it's where we're at at the moment. Um, other factors, vitrectomized eyes. So vitrectomized and where there's a lot of exudate, we think that steroid, there's a very high clearance of anti-VEGF. It doesn't last for very long in a vitrectomized eye. So again, we may consider steroid above anti-VEGF. Um, if they're aphakic or they have a big PI, a surgical PI, or they've had any infection. So if they've had toxoplasmosis, for example, that's had to be treated, active treatments of infections at the back of the eyes, we would not give steroid. That's a very, that's an absolute contraindication to steroid treatment. Um, <laughs> And then we've got these other factors that we consider. So whether there, there's traction and we might, we might consider um, vitrectomy, as I mentioned, the surgical part of, of treatment. And then this other um, part of it, which is what's going on in the rest of the eye. So do they have proliferative retinopathy or do they have near vascular glaucoma? So do they have rubiosis, um, in which case anti-VEGF is very, very valuable. So that can, that can treat the ischemic part of what's going on as well as the macular edema. So I've put at the bottom, very important to grade the periphery. So not only are we thinking DMO and DMO in which eye, is it both eyes, one eye, but you then have to grade the retinopathy and that all forms part of the treatment plan. Adjuvant laser, as I say, can be done at any stage and with any mix of, of treatments. Can we take a question, please, oh, yeah. um, Esther? So Atif Sa, um, would you like to unmute your microphone? He's got his hand up. That's if you're just muted. No, 
Here we go. Oh. He said sorry. He obviously he's having Yeah, no worry. Issues. No okay. worry. Any time. So we can put up now there should be a the fifth question, which is a treatment question. Yeah. There's more than one um, answer. Yeah. It can be selected here. It's multiple. Yeah. So hopefully you're able to, to do that. Yes, you are. Okay. Shall we end the poll? Oh, perfect. So, yeah. Very good. It's all of them. So they're, they're all available. As we say, the, the mainstay are the intravitreal anti-VEGF steroids. We also use intravitreal injection um, laser. Yes, less so, but yes, it is still a, a useful modality. And for those with the, with um, any sort of uh, it, with vitreous, vitreous macular traction, we may consider vitreo retinal surgery. The, the reality is you would tend to start with anti-VEGF whatever and see the response. And if it's a suboptimal response, then you may refer to vitreo retinal colleagues to have a look as well. So um, talking about the patient and hospital treatment burden, this is, this is an enormous, um, burden on the health service and by burden it, it's it's being used in a in in a um, medical uh, way so um, these are working age patients compared to macular edema sorry to amd patients who are also coming in for injections frequently there are multiple appointments so a diabetic patient with dmo will on average have over 30 appointments for other aspects of their diabetes um, per year. So just imagine that. So we're talking about to their GP, it may be to the for renal, it may be for um, neurology, for autonomic symptoms, it may be for their feet, to the dietitian. Um, the list goes on and on. And um, more than 30 appointments a year for somebody working age. And they come to us and we say, you're going to need injections. You need to come back every month for the next five months. And then they may need their other eye treated, for example, and they may need another set of monthly loading dose injections, et cetera. This is very, very onerous. And as a result of that, there is also the burden on, on hospital clinics. So um, with, with COVID and... Uh, uh, the COVID year made things quite a lot easier in terms of um, we halted, we, we continued, for example, with intravitreal injections for AMD because those can't be halted because those are absolutely immediately site threatening. Um, but for diabetes, for example, then there were delays in um, in treatments and we are we are now going through that uh, a lot of the patients who had delays in treatment and restarting loading doses etc again so this is this is a it's a it's a very big deal um anti-vegf so at the start monthly injections as i say five or six usually um by three injections you pretty much know from the uh from the response whether that's going to be something something that um, is giving an optimal response. If they're doing nothing by three injections, then it's it's pretty unlikely, to be honest. But there are a proportion, maybe about 10 or 15% of patients who are what are called late responders, who may not start to respond well with their macular edema until injection eight or nine. So the question is then, for that small number, if you look at population uh, population level for the small number that require that are you going to keep everyone going at eight or nine injections and the answer is no you won't um, you will, and the patients won't want that either um, so usually by three or four you have a good idea whether they're starting to respond and if they're not then you consider something else so the something else may be if they're already pseudophagic would be steroid 
um, if they've particularly if they've got those biomarkers um, uh, and we've got different steroids which I'll, I'll go through as well um, there's a huge need for longer acting agents so Ozodex is very helpful lasts about four or five months on average and as I say it's only currently for pseudophagic patients so if somebody has got uh, has got significant DMO um, and has got a degree of cataract um, we will offer them cataract surgery and put the Ozodex in at the same time um, but we can't treat patients with clear lenses with Ozodex currently. So just to show you a few little pictures um, to show what the what this stuff looks like. So we have um, three agents that are so we have Avastin, Ilea, and Lucentis available to us in the in the NHS. Um, Avastin, unlicensed and non-approved, but can be used. We we can use it um, if the patient falls outside outside guideline outside guidelines and it's particularly useful in the not for DMO particularly useful in um, patients with um, rubiosis and for rapid control of of rubiosis and proliferative disease there are newer trial agents lots of things on the market so brolicizumab which we're starting to use has, has now got nice approval for AMD um, and the trial results are starting to come through now for DMO. So we will have that available soon. And that's looking quite promising for pushing back the interval of anti-VEGF so, so that we're needing to give, give less injections, so greater interval between injections. And ferisumab, which if you remember back to the pathogenesis, this ANG2 pathway is thought to be very important as well as the VEGF pathway. Um, and that's also looking very promising for giving better dry as a better drying agent and and also um, increasing longevity between the injections. This is what Ozodex looks like. It's a little it looks like a tiny little piece of a yellow hair, if you like. You may see it in the back of the eye like that, depending on where it's sitting. And it's slowly and through the pupil here you can see it and transillumination um, if it's like that it can be a bit a bit um, bothersome to the patients they don't particularly like it if it's wafting in there as you can imagine if it's wafting in their visual axis but it doesn't last long like that it does settle in the eye um, you can't really control where it's where it's going to sit within the within the vitreous and particularly if it's a vitrectomized eye um, it, it, so it, it's not a major major problem and it breaks up slowly over about over about four months then there's a longer acting agent called alluvian which is ozodex is dexamethasone alluvian is fluosinolone they are different steroids it's given with a different introducer also intravitreal this is all by the way being done in clean rooms this is not done in the operating theater this is done just with topical drops and iodine to to reduce the risk of any infection and it's done in a clean room situation um, and alluvian can last up to three years. It's uh, results that that um, we've seen. It can be very useful for patients who really cannot attend the hospital very often, but are still able to be monitored somewhere for pressure rises because it is a steroid. Um, haven't seen any any remarkable success with it. Um, it's, it's useful in particular situations, as I say, where particularly where people have um, are unable to get to the hospital very often, and it's providing a level of control. Um, it's quite difficult for a physician to take on board this sort of three year medication. It hasn't massively taken off in years, Illuvian. It's, it's really you'll hear a lot more about dexamethasone, um, but it does have a place. And we're currently looking at our dexameth are ozodex patients to see of the ones who have a very good response and respond to repeated ozodex can they now can, will they show a similar response if we if we switch them to alluvian it's not the same steroid it's not a given that it will respond in the same way but it's um it, it is a useful thing to consider because it's got potentially such a long long um action in the eye so just a few pictures just to really give you a sense of um, multimodal imaging and what we do in the in the clinic so we'll have our our, our funders photograph up the OCT we might have a fluorescein up as well so we're assessing everything together um, similarly here looking at a, a fluorescein an OCTA 
the OCT and the response from the OCT to um, treatment. And again here, just looking at um, what's happened over, over time. This is, this is a patient who's had multiple, so this is anti-VEGF injections. Ozodex similarly, so we'd look at it in this, in this way so that we can get some idea of what's happening with the intervals of treatment. And similarly here, after single Ozodex. A partic one particular situation that we consider slightly differently, which I've alluded to, is proliferative with, with DMO. This is a very high risk situation require, and you really need to treat this very urgently and stress to the patient that this is, this is a situation where they cannot miss appointments. So anti-VEGF treats both parts of this, as I mentioned. So that's, that's the treatment of choice. You wouldn't choose a steroid in this situation. You want to get the proliferative um, under control and the DMO will go with it. Um, you can uh, do uh, laser treatment um, as well as um, it's not yet nice approved to use anti-VEGF to control proliferative retinopathy, but we can do it. We can use Avastin to do that. And there is trial data to show that ILEA is, is, um, has the same effect and Lucentis has the same effect, but we haven't had a, it is currently not nice approved for that condition, but we do use Avastin for it. And that will rapidly get things under control from the proliferative side. And then we can do the laser treatment to permanently stabilize things. So a combination of anti-VEGF and PRP is what we, we do, and it'll treat both aspects, the DMO and the proliferative. Should we put up the um, question six, please, Samal? Side effects of steroids in any form in the eye, including intra vitreal steroids include so still the numbers are going up okay so good so yes cataract absolutely and that's the reason why nice did not approve um, Ozodex for phakic patients because it will increase cataract. It's pure finance um, because, as we know, patients, especially diabetic patients, will develop cataract. Um, but it will it it, it can um, it can speed that up. So cataract raise pressure, which is what we have to we have to monitor. Um, it's we we don't have a we don't find a, any great problem with raised pressure. It's uh, around about 15% perhaps of patients with Ozodex may, uh, may get raised um, pressure over the duration. It, it peaks at about two months. So sometimes you may find that patients come with a letter from the hospital saying, could you please just check the pressure at two months? Um, and if it's normal, that's absolutely fine. And then we see them again at two months, uh, two months after that. So the peak is at two months. Um, and usually if it is, if it is raised above 25 millimeters of mercury or so, we may give a, a drop. We may just give something topical. Um, and that's usually it. It is very unusual to have to do anything more urgent or active for very high pressures. It does exist very occasionally. You will get patients who who will need to have urgent trabeculectomy, but it's very, it's very unusual. Um, but then this third one, C, recurrence of latent infection. Yes, good, whoever answered that. This is really important. So that's what I was alluding to about people who'd had um, toxoplasmosis or any kind of infection at the back of the eye. CMV is a, is a, is a, a, a key one as well. So um, cytomegalovirus um, uh, chorioretinitis um this will reactivate with steroid so and we've seen that um so patients who've had so they need a very careful look at the back of the eye make sure these are these are rare to have retinal infections or choroidal infections this is a rare thing but it does exist and with and toxo is not that rare um so you do have to have to have a careful look at the back of the eye know that the patient has never had to have anything treated at the back of the eye in terms of infection because that is an absolute contraindication to using steroid okay all good 
So we are nearing the end. So just a few more pictures. So this is the combination, just showing you combination of proliferative and DMO. So DMO at the bottom with subretinal fluid and intraretinal fluid. And we're seeing on a fluorescein just uh, uh, the disc lighting up. So there's NVD and NVE. And again, on this picture, so marked ischemia, you can see on the fluorescein, all this black is where all the capillaries have dropped out. The disc is lighting up, so hot disc um, with near vascularization of the disc and near vascularization elsewhere and macular edema. So this combination responds well to anti-VEGF. Quite what the final visual result is, is a different question altogether. So I don't know, it's, it's a small image at the bottom, but you can probably see that the, um, the outer retina is, is not normal. So this, would, this is a guarded prognosis in terms of visual um, recovery, but at least you will have halted progression and stopped, um, stopped near vascular glaucoma. So vitreo macular traction, so this is the situation where you might consider surgery just to show you whether there's actually traction from this, um, from the vitreous, and this is showing here this flat topped is a, is a typical sort of picture um, where the, the retina is peaked up, and that would be a situation where if the vision was reduced, you might consider um, vitrectomy. Macular laser, so this is just showing... Um, if you just look at, along the bottom at the thickness, um, the thickness OCT scans, so micropulse or subthreshold laser um, shows you, you see no evidence of the laser. So um, it can be very useful in particularly in treating focal macular edema, um, but unlike the um, standard ETDRS which is the big study, the big original studies showing how to apply thermal laser, and you still see thermal laser scars in the retina, you see nothing with subthreshold. It's a very gentle treatment and you can repeat it. Um, so it is, it's, it is definitely has its place. So uh, just to go to referrals from optometric practice, so just to stress, it's not an immediately sight-threatening disease but it does need soon uh, referrals soon and that's especially if vision is reduced um, the standard referral pathway would be via a local desk so that's usually through the through the gps unless you've got some other avenue to do that directly um, and that would be a situation for example where you've incidentally picked up that there are a few exudates at the at the macula that doesn't require anything other than an initial uh, local desk. If it's worse than that, so if vision's reduced or there really is significant DMO or you're seeing a lot of other retinopathy with it, then absolutely can be directly referred to HESTS, to the hospital eye service. But, um, but it is very useful if it's very early disease that the local diabetic screening programs actually take these patients and because we get a, a very clear audit trail that way. So we can go to the last um, question, please, Sam. Still undecided, few people undecided still. Okay, we'll end the poll now. Okay, good. So um, it, it, the answer is no. I mean, in terms of should always be treated, the answer is no. When we go back to that protocol V, um, if somebody has good vision, even if there's center involving edema, we would watch it. So this is should always be treated. Uh, that, that's sort of, you know, if you, if you were just looking at that quickly and thinking we should absolutely should be monitored, but no, it, it does not always need treating. So, so very good vision. Um, uh, can be monitored and that we've got from trial data okay but in monitoring closely very good we have a question sure uh, why, we're right at, we're at the end anyway so it's perfect so any questions i'm happy to take now why is the elipsoid zone so important on the oct 
so uh, the importance of that is that that is where the um, photoreceptors lie. So if there is disruption of the ellipsoid zone, um, and that includes the RPE, which is the critical layer for metabolic activity between the choroid and the retina. So anything in that area is absolutely critical for the functioning of the cells. And ellipsoid zone involves photoreceptor layers are within that. Um, so if you've got disruption of that, you can you you will have reduced vision. So you can look at an OCT and have a fairly um, accurate idea irrespective of anything else in the eye, assuming no media opacity, et cetera, whether the vision is likely to be affected or not if the ellipsoid zone is affected or if there's drill. So remember that's in the, in the inner layers. Okay, um, another question from Puneet. Did you find the posner scholzman syndrome, Esther? Uh, me, <laughs> I wish. <laughs> so it's quite it's quite nice to have the have the name, but I don't think related to me, sadly. But I can pretend because he is quite quite an influential ophthalmologist. Any more questions? If anybody's wondering, by the way, this is the Clinica um, waiting room. So any patients who are sent to Clinica would would enjoy this lovely waiting room. Very lovely waiting room. Uh, yes, the recording will be available, um, Amberin. Um, on the Clinica website, we have a professionals area where the recording will be placed. And I have um, sent everybody a, I've put in the chat the link to the Survey Monkey, which you need to please fill in so we can uh, credit your CET points. You will get an email as well, but if you wanted it, it's in the chat. You're welcome. Um, then we have another question mm -hmm. from Parminda. If monitoring demo, how often? So if you're monitoring somebody with, with good vision um, and maybe just a few extra foveal, very fine exudates, for example, then we would, we would recommend around about every three or four months. And if they've got worse control, so if it's somebody who's got very poor systemic control, so this is diet, DMO is about looking at the whole patient, really critical. So if this is somebody on dialysis or very poor control, very poor blood pressure, et cetera, not necessarily that you need to bring it down to monthly, for example, but you need to just make sure the patient understands how important the monitoring is because they can get worse quicker that three or four months is fine. And that's what we do in the hospital. And um, CTAL is asking, when is steroid treatment preferable? SRF slash IRF? Yeah, so the, the SRF, very much that biomarker, remember, it's one of the biomarker, the OCT biomarkers, and SRF, the subretinal fluid, yes, seems to be um, more of an indicator of, of an inflammatory component so we would we would take that into account and if somebody as i say was pseudophagic and we could currently give a, a steroid then that would be our preference as um as first line rather than do rather than loading doses of anti-vegf okay but yes the subretinal fluid does seem to be a marker of inflammation and therefore steroid is a better option You're welcome. Arun says, thank you for the brilliant event. As always, good evening. Well, good evening to you too. Any Pleasure. more questions? Really lovely talk, Esther. Thank you. Pleasure. I wish you all well. If there's anything, anything specific you think of afterwards, I'm very happy to respond by email as well. So um, if there's anything, anything later on, let me know. Okay, then we shall um, end this evening and um, wish, yeah, wish everybody thank you. Everybody's sending um, thanks through the chat and thank you so much, Esther. Um, I'm sure it was Pleasure. very beneficial. And um, good evening. I've, I've, I'm just <laughs> watching a lot of people saying thank you. So thank you Pleasure. for coming. <laughs> Have a good rest of your evening, everyone. Okay. Thanks very much, Sam. Bye.
Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.